what I help people understand is being a few standard deviations away from what is the norm makes you who you are and makes you unique makes you unique and and again you and i've talked about this before quite often one of the best things that i've found to develop self-concept and self-esteem is to make a list of requirements not what i have to offer but what are the requirements it takes to be with me yeah but that requires some serious self-reflection and with with people struggling with with that circular I I need them. I need that approval. I need their validation to cut that for a minute and not make it about that, but to first go, what do I love? What makes me happy? What, what do I want out of life? And then to make those lists to be like, well, I love running not fishing. I love to run. I love the wind on my face. I love, and so great, you established, you love this. Now, do you want a life without it? No. Then only accept somebody who will support that time, support that energy, help you buy those great running shoes. Here is something that deserves to be protected, but you've got to find those things that deserve to be protected. I have lived most of my life, Jim, with that should. You shouldn't be this way. You should stop this. You shouldn't. You, I have been told by partners that I wasn't made right, that I was wrong for being, people shouldn't be this way. The, the natural way is to be a different and and for as much as I was offended or hurt by that, a deeper, more lasting part of me that I am still discovering has believed it. And so much of my life has been trying to to prove, well, but 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 I'm not unnatural. But 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 I like being social. I love. I was told I was too social. I was told I was unnatural for being a night person instead of a morning person. That that was not natural. You didn't fit into that template, right? And instead of going, accepting somebody for the that is on you. Um, so you wanted to find a shirt that others found acceptable and think what would be really neat mm-hmm. and cool rather than pick out a shirt that you thought was really neat and cool. Yes. And allowing somebody to walk through a room and go, it's okay if you don't like this shirt because I do and I'm home now. And with somebody that goes like, hey, that shirt that you're wearing, that, that that's your favorite, I like that. I support that and I want to protect that shirt. So how many relationships did you stay in that were you stayed in because they were familiar rather than comfortable? Ooh. <sighs> uh, let's see. At least one, two, three. At least three. But the other two... I stayed in <laughs> because it was a should. Oh. Well, I I I said that I would commit and do this and so I'm going to give it a good college try. People have told me I have not tried hard enough before. Uh. People told me that I shouldn't run away, so I am not going to run away or instead of having that cognitive this is what this person does, but this is who he is, to put them together to go, this person is what he does. Well, some people feel, and this is another template, that in order to be happy, you have to be in a relationship. And sometimes that's reinforced by other people. Oh, Joanna can't be happy. We have to get her into a relationship. I had had a conversation with with my mom, was it post-college? And people at church had stopped asking me when I was going to bring a nice boy home. <laughs> when? And I w- it was a relief. I'm like, oh, thank mm-hmm. goodness. Because while I loved men, I was commitment phobic. I didn't want to be, don't fence me in. Don't fence me in, Jim. I, uh, And so I had this tendency to run away. And the idea of just locking down and being committed wasn't 
in inherently intuitive to me. And so it was a relief when people stopped asking when I would fit into this box. But my mom, I remember at one point, I pressed her just a little bit and she finally blurted out, but uh, what if you never get married? And I said, then I never get married, mom. And that's okay. And I had to name, get her to name her worst fear for me and let her know that that wasn't my worst fear. Me not getting married wasn't my failure. That was her worried that that was my biggest fear. And so while she, if she really wants my happiness, then she can let me find that. And, um, and then I did get married and that did not work out. And that's something else. The idea that a relationship is happily ever after is so incredibly world-endingly damaging to go friendships end, relationships end, and you choose it because you should, because you, because you want it and because you can choose it. But choosing it for today does not mean it's going to be the thing that is right for you in 10, 20 years. Well, Joanna, I consider relationships like the ocean, that there's many currents and sometimes they run concurrently. Sometimes they flow together and without any animosity or ill will, those currents tend to flow flow apart in other directions. I'm sure there's people in your life that you have no animosity or ill will toward. Right. However, you're just not in the same yes. current. And that's that's what happened. Um my one of one of my past relationships I ended because it wasn't healthy for the first time within the relationship I realized Neither of us is happy. This is not healthy. So why this could, because it was comfortable and because it was a familiar pattern and because the most hurtful part of it, but it is so valuable to realize because there was also love there, it would have been easy to limp along indefinitely when neither of us was getting what we needed and why why stay in that and the the one of the hardest things that i have done that i am so thankful that i did as i told this individual i love you this isn't working because those two things are not mutually exclusive people are in a constant state of change uh, you know, we've said this many times on the show in past podcasts, but Alice uh, said to the uh, rabbit, I'm not the same person I was this morning. And uh, the rabbit says, well, I certainly hope not. Uh, so we, I, we get together when certain conditions exist. Let's, let's call, let's say this is a marriage and we'll probably get a lot of comments on this, but <laughs> when, but when. Two people are married mm. and they take a vow together. That vow is based on conditions that exist at that time. Yep. Okay. So maybe years later or whoever later, those conditions no longer exist. So how can those vows be valid if those conditions, when those vows were made, no longer exist? And how unfair is it to your future self? and your future partner to put those, not just confines, but the most damn it, those expectations. That was one of the things that I realized every time a relationship failed, I felt so stupid. And I was putting hope to death every single time because I had put hope in that. Putting hope thought, to death. Yes. Wow. How about that? So have, and also in relationships, have you found that neither party wants to be the one that pushes the button because they want the other person to do it first? Well, you have to take responsibility for the world ending, Jim, and nobody wants that. I, and, and we all have ways of sabotaging, but you're right, pulling that trigger and, and the, the two times that I pulled the trigger the it was 
I, 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 I had to physically constrain myself and, and talk through to be like, but, 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 but wait, there was every reason why I needed to do that. It just felt too big. It felt too hurtful. It felt too, and I'm like, but I love, oh, well, yes, I love this person, but that doesn't make my decision the wrong one. So this you know? is a concept that we try to help people understand, particularly younger people, how important it is to label and identify how they feel and as if they have no control. How many times did maybe someone, your father, your mother, anybody say to you, well, how are you feeling, Joanne? And maybe you'd be crying and you'd say, I don't know. Yeah. So we help them identify and label exactly define how they feel, then they have some type of control in it. And what we try to do is help younger people and even all well, way older people understand that emotions are like puffs of smoke and they'll blow away in the wind unless we attach our thoughts to them. And then they'll just stretch out into affinity. That agony can last for eons. So what we try to help people is maybe when you're with your daughter or I'm with mine or my son and they tell me about this heartache, they define exactly how they feel. I'll say to them, yes, you feel that way at present, right now or in this moment. So if we can add some immediacy to how we feel and that's what we can help, let's say, a 15-year-old Joanna has a, uh, has a heartache. Uh, someone was mean to her or her and her romantic interest broke up and you're heartbroken. And you could, maybe you could say to your father, your mother, Oh, I feel so horrible. I feel that. And generally a parent would say, Oh honey, you're so lovely. There's many, many more people out there. This guy doesn't deserve you. How many times have you heard that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but if it would be nice to say, yes, honey, I know you feel that way right now or at present. Yes. That's the way you feel. Or in this moment, Joanna, yes, you hurt. So if we add some help people understand the immediacy to their feelings and emotions, then, then, it, then it doesn't seem like it's going to last forever. And also, it, it, acknowledging the emotions in the moment, it, it's not fixing it. So we so often don't be sad. Well, don't tell me how to feel. <laughs> I and 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 we then put guilt on top of oh I'm sad and I shouldn't feel sad and and I I try to practice the same kindness with others to go I am sorry you're feeling depressed. I'm sorry you're sad. I can understand why you would be sad. That's a lot. It's a bad day. And instead of fighting those feelings because I don't know why people don't acknowledge. I, I used to do, I, I still do them, but I remember when I would take the bus to work in the morning, in the early days after divorce, and I would check in with myself, what kind of day, oh, it's a low day. I'm feeling low. Okay. Then I wasn't spending the entire day with a short temper. I wasn't spending the entire day fighting the feelings that were naturally present. And instead, I could enjoy. I didn't feel like I needed to fake a smile. I could have a smile that was sincere, even if it didn't glow as brightly. I could listen to my sad music. I could write. I could give myself that grace and just experience, today is a low day. And that's fine. Why isn't it fine? Well, we live in a world where we're told that we shouldn't experience any discomfort at all. Right. And that if we experience discomfort, sadness, unhappiness, pain, whatever, then we need to have that fixed immediately. Fixed. We need to take a pill. We need to have a procedure. Yeah. We need to do this. Or can we just accept the pain? Now, the psychiatrist that I worked with for years, my mentor and my friend, uh, Safter Chaudhary, would often say, uh, those, are, those are learning days. He would term those learning days. Or someone would call me and say, you know what, all I want to do is just lay in my bed and pull my covers up over my head. And I say, well, maybe today's the day to do that. Yeah. And they say, well, I am feel sad. Well, then then feel sad. Feel sad. Then feel sad. Oh, and what a relief to know that you can do that and that you are actually helping yourself heal what th th that – that adage, there's no way but through it. So instead of denying that sadness and denying that, those don't go anywhere. They're all waiting. 
They're all waiting, invalidated, and and waiting to attack and and ruin a moment, ruin a goal, ruin you know. Stop thinking that it, way, Joanna. That's that. That's not right. You don't think that way, right? <laughs> right. And so, instead of acknowledging that, oh, and I would feel so much better, and I would heal faster because I was experiencing the feelings that I was actually feeling, and. When you were talking about the emotions being, you know, puffs of smoke, we can make them immediate. But I also try to make sure feelings aren't always, sometimes they are rational, but oftentimes feelings are irrational. But if we can tether them to, so why do you think you are feeling that way? If we can tether them, the feelings become less less, oh, there's, there's a word, less potent. Because if you trail back this feeling of anxiety to, I was running five lit minutes late this morning, and then I dumped my coffee in my car, <laughs> and then I tripped, and I, and I just let it build. But what is there? There's nothing. You were five minutes late. You didn't lose your job. You still have your friends. You were able to accomplish what you wanted to accomplish. It just didn't go well. But now you're this giant ball of anxiety and you don't need to right now. So following these feelings back to something concrete, and it might be something important, but it takes away that that scary, I'm overwhelmed with feelings and I don't know what to do with all of these feelings. You can tether it back to go, ah, that's why I'm sad. Well, there's an old 12-step saying that you can't read the label when you're inside the bottle. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't has more to do than with drug or alcohol addiction. What it has to do with if you're inside depression, if you're inside anxiety, if you're inside heartache, you can't read the label on it. I'm sure that you've had girlfriends and guy friends and maybe yourself. You had a girlfriend or a guy friend and you said to yourself, what is that person doing with them? They're so awful to them. And because you can read the label. And maybe if you'd mention that to that person, they get pretty angry with you. Oh, absolutely. Like 99% of the time. Please check out our website at fishingwithoutfaith.com, where you can listen to the show, comment on our discussions, and find out where you can subscribe to our podcast. If you're interested in flying the colors of Fishing Without Bait, click the shop icon on our website. We have clothing, mugs, cell phone cases, and so much more. Show the world that you fish without bait. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.